Hello? Hi, everybody. Everybody still have energy at the end of the day? We're still here attending? I'm sorry, what? <laughs> so, all right, I want to start this with what is going to seem like possibly an unrelated question. Um, how far do you live from an airport? The closest airport. Think about what you were gonna think about what you would say about that. You could say it out loud or not, or you know, just think about it. I, when when I when this question comes up, uh, I have no problem saying that I live 20 minutes from an airport. That's basically factual as far as I'm concerned. Like I will drop that into conversation. Um, but of course, that's not really true. That's dependent on a series of assumptions. It assumes, for example, that I'm in a car. Uh, walking to the airport, in my case O'Hare, uh, would take a lot longer. It assumes the weather is good, which in Chicago is dicey for about half the year. Uh, it assumes that it's not rush hour, which means that's dicey for another like 10% of the day. Uh, nothing untoward happens like blowing up a tire. Uh, on my way here yesterday, I learned another assumption, uh, which is the assumption that the cab driver takes the optimal route to the airport. Uh, if the cab driver messes around in the back roads of my suburb, it takes a couple minutes longer. Um, despite that, despite the fact that all of these factors would conspire to make my trip longer, okay, I still say that my trip to the airport takes 20 minutes, even though there's no way it could possibly take less than 20 minutes unless I went, uh, unless I teleported. Um, and, and all kinds of ways for it to take longer. In other words, uh, and I still find this 20-minute estimate, for lack of a better term, to be so valuable that I use it, and I don't even know the actual distance that I live from the airport in miles. I only know it in minutes, even though it's problematic. So my name is Noel Rappin. Uh, this talk is 20, uh, 30 minutes. I realized I had more time in the slot, so it's 30 minutes, give or take 10. Uh, it's going to be very embarrassing when I go over at the end, so we'll <laughs> Get that out of the way right now. Uh, I work for CableXI, which is a consulting firm in Chicago. Uh, if you need consultants in Chicago or you want to be a consultant in Chicago, come find me at some point over the next couple of days. Or if you just want a nice green circle sticker with an XI on it, uh, I have a bunch of those as well. You can also follow me on Twitter, at Noel Rapp, if you wanted to say something about this talk or just uh, say hi in general. My qualifications for talking about estimates, well, uh, once upon a time, I gave an entire full day workshop that ended exactly at 4 o'clock on the dot as scheduled, as evidenced by this one tweet from one guy sometime. And since I actually got an estimate right once, I think I'm very qualified to talk about estimates. I'm also, this is also slightly idios, I'm also slightly idiosyncratic about this. Um, you will probably disagree with some of this. Many people do. Uh, People are somehow successful, even if they do estimates a different way than I do. I don't know how that works, but apparently they are. Um, and that's fine. This is, this is a way that works for me, and it's a method that works for me. Uh, and you may do something different or have different opinions, and that's fine. So one thing that you hear about estimates is that developers are bad at them. I think that's something that almost everybody in this room has probably heard. That estimates suck. Developers are bad at them. We can't do it right. And Sometimes the, your question is, like, are software developers uh, uniquely bad at estimates? Is this, sometimes you hear it phrased like that we are so bad that we have problems that no other industry has because of our estimates. And the only thing I can say to something like that is that people who say something like that have obviously never been involved in any kind of home remodeling or uh, construction project or are involving any kind of home contractor because that is an entire industry that is dedicated to time overruns and cost overruns, and has an entire vocabulary dedicated basically to scope creep. Uh, and it has a lot of similarities to software in that a lot of times you don't really understand the problem until you try to solve it. You don't, you don't really know what's behind the wall until you, t until you tear the wall down. Uh, and it has very similar pressures in terms of uh, a pressure to uh, deliver an initial estimate that's low uh, for obvious reasons, for, you know, to make a sale or for other reasons. Or I can point you to this. Uh, this is Boston's big dig. Uh, do people here live in Boston, near Boston? I lived in Boston for a pretty good chunk of this. Uh, this was the most ambitious public works project in America in the 2000s. Uh, it was an attempt, a, a successful attempt, to replace 
the north-south overpass highway through Boston with a series of north-south tunnels. Um, it occurred to me as I was putting this together that in, in uh, reference to the airport analogy, it also involved an exciting game of how will we get to the airport this week uh, for about two years as the access roads got messed up. Um, the Big Dig was originally estimated at $5.8 billion, which is a lot of money. Uh, it came in a tiny bit over that at a mere 21.93, <laughs> uh, and counting because they're still fixing a couple things that weren't installed correctly the first time. Uh, so estimation is not just our problem. There are other industries and there are other kinds of engineering that have similar issues when trying to come up with a time or a money estimate for the work that they do. Uh, but software, we have, a, we have a slightly more unique solution because it's, in, at least in theory, easier to change software estimates and move software around than it is to move walls or giant, earth, giant tunnels underneath Boston or things like that. So potentially there's something that we can do about it. Um, some people, sometimes you will hear now the suggestion, uh, people who think about agile projects, that we don't estimate. That software estimates are so bad that they're actually a net negative to project success or project happiness. And so they will, you can find these people sometimes, the, the no estimates is sometimes a hashtag or a, 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 the sort of rallying cry on blog posts or whatever. And they suggest that we don't estimate and that we just do stuff and get paid. Uh, the ideal world here is that you continually are in a very tight feedback cycle where you take the highest priority task remaining, you do it uh, until you're done or the client runs out of money or gets mad, or some combination of all of those things. Uh, so you can just do stuff and get paid. And I can imagine this working in maybe a startup environment, a product environment, where you don't really have a deadline or customers or clients and there is enough money to cover all of this. But I'm a consultant working with clients with tight budgets and it feels somewhat similar to me saying like, we're just gonna tear up your kitchen and you just keep writing me $15,000 checks and eventually you'll probably get your kitchen back. Um, it is not effective. It's not, it's not useful to our customers. Uh, customers, I think, reasonably expect to have some kind of idea what they're getting into before they start a project. And it is on us to give them some sort of good faith plan to do that. You sometimes hear that projects don't fail for technical reasons. Projects fail in part for communication reasons. And I think estimates are a very important piece of communication between the team that's doing the work and the team that is paying for the work, managing the work, covering the work. Um, but you have to be careful with it because it's communication that has dollar signs attached. You know, anything that gets a number attached suddenly acquires a certain weight and a certain gravity in discussion and it's hard to move it. And especially once you put a dollar sign on something, no matter how crazy or half-assed your process was to get to that dollar sign, once you put a dollar sign on it in the mind of, in the, mind of the person that's, that you were talking to, that is a real thing, and you need to take that into account uh, in, in future discussions. So if estimates are communication, what are they communicating? Well, you're communicating, I think, you know, the, on the most basic level, you're communicating the investment. Uh, in this case, not just the monetary investment. You're communicating all the things that the people need, that need to be provided to the development team in order to get the project done. So that is money, it's time, it's potentially a certain amount of requirements analysis, um, some kind of data format, some sort of business plan. All of those things can be part of the estimation process. The estimate also enables you to communicate progress. It's kind of hard to say you're 50% done if you don't know what done is. Um, estimates, estimates help you define what is in scope and what is out of scope uh, for the purposes of being done. So that's the other thing that estimates communicate is, is scope. So this is a, these are all things that need to be done as part of a good project and talking about the estimate and, the, and, and planning it uh, is a really good uh, framework for communicating and getting that shared understanding up front. Okay. Uh, but a bad estimate does have consequences. We've all, pro many of us have probably been on projects uh, where there was an unrealistic estimate up front and that creates an unrealistic expectation and it creates a lot of bad pressures on the development team, uh, and a bad cycle uh, that leads to poor work and slipping, estimate, slipping deadlines even further. Um, 
And bad estimates also, or badly used estimates, also allow for a certain kind of micromanaging, where it becomes critically important that you know you said this report, you said that this reporting feature was going to be done on Tuesday. It's Thursday. Where is it? Uh, and that can allow that kind of very, very fine-grained managing, whether it comes from a client or from your actual manager or something like that, um, can also be really counterproductive uh, in the course of a project. So one thing, one then, so if bad estimates do that, really, I think we should just do good estimates. Um, the easiest way that I know of is to do, good, to do good estimates is to wait until the end of the project and then produce your estimate. Um, this is an underrated technique. Uh, that I've seen actually used at large companies when they produce the estimate at the end to cover and retroactively cover their budgets. Um, however, most of the time, you actually need to produce an estimate at the beginning of the project, and estimating at the beginning of the project is basically the worst. You don't know anything. Uh, Gary was talking about known, un uh, known unknowns and unknown unknowns. At the beginning of a project, you have the most unknowns of all kinds, known and unknown, uh, and it, it, this is something that only incrementally gets better, but unfortunately, uh, clients insist on knowing an estimate at the beginning. You know, this is a little bit like trying to figure out how much time it's going to go to the airport. It's going to take you to get to the airport if you don't even know where the airport is or haven't even decided if you're going to need to fly yet. Um, so what can make an estimate at the beginning of a project effective even when we know nothing? about the project or very little about the details of it. So I'm going to talk about a couple of different processes by which you can create an estimate, first of all, an estimate that sort of works over the running life of a project, um, and then how to modify that to create an estimate that might work at the beginning of a project. And it's going to have a, rare, a reasonably good chance of success. Uh, it, it's worked for me in the past. Um, but first, I need to make sure that we're all clear on a couple of agile project software terms, because I'm going to use them, and I want to make sure we all, we, we all have a common definition. So we're going to talk about a feature or a story, uh, which is the unit of work in a project. Uh, typically, they are relatively small on the order of a couple of days or a week or so, ideally less. The main thing about them is that they are, at least in theory, um, independent of each other and independently verifiable by the customer or the manager that when they're, as to when they're done. Okay. In iteration, is the unit of planning in an Agile project. It's typically one or two weeks. Uh, and ideally, the way that this works is you think about how, you, you, at the beginning of each iteration, the team gets together. They talk about what stories they're going to complete over this iteration. And that's, how, that, that is, that's the cadence of which planning gets done in an iteration project. Point is the size of a story. And we'll talk more about exactly what points are in a second. Hopefully, that'll just come back. Um, and then velocity, which is the most important number, which is the number of points that you can do in an iteration. And the way that you use that is to be able to say, uh, I have done, we've done 10 points in this iteration. We can do 10 points in the next iteration. We can do 10 points in the iteration after that. Uh, we have about 100 points left in the project, so we have about 10 iterations to go. That's, that's, those, are the, those are the kinds of sentences that you say. So here's a theory about how to do this, or a couple of things that, that, that work or, or uh, that I have worked for me. Um, the first thing to think of when you start thinking about whether how to create an estimate uh, is that there's two different scales here. We're talking about estimating the entire project, like this will be able to go live on December 15th, versus estimating individual features. Uh, I can get this reporting feature done by Tuesday. And the first thing to realize in creating a successful estimate over the life of a project uh, is that nobody really cares about the fine-grained feature estimates. There's a whole lot of effort put into them. Uh, and yet, at the same time, really, it's not important over the life cycle of a project. Whether an individual feature is done on Tuesday or Thursday, uh, or it takes a little bit less or a little bit longer, over time, over the life cycle of a project, that is not the important part. The important part is when you can actually go live and when people use stuff. Okay. The important thing is the aggregate, not the individual. Okay. The individual estimates are only useful because they are the building blocks that you use to get to the aggregate estimate. Okay. And estimates are estimates. They are imprecise by nature. Uh, if they were exact, we would call them measurements. But they are actually probabilistic. 
If I look at a weather report and it says that the chance of rain is 50% and it rains, was that forecast accurate? It's actually, you actually can't tell from one piece of data. So you actually need like, say 20 pieces of data. It's actually, may not even, that might even, not even be enough. But if it, you know, they said there was a 50% chance of rain 20 times and it rained 11 of them, you would say that that process is reasonable. It's producing reasonable data. If I say there's a chance of a 50% chance of rain 20 times and it rains four times, then there's something wrong in my process. I'm overestimating uh, the chance of rain. And as a hint, weather forecasters overestimate the chance of rain uh, because if they say it's going to rain and it doesn't rain, uh, nobody gets mad at them. But if they say that it isn't going to rain and it does rain, people get really upset. So that's, in some ways, it's actually a very similar pressure to what we have on software estimates. So similarly, if I say this is a one-point story and it takes me six hours, that doesn't really say anything about the process by which I call this a one-point story or about one-point stories in the future. What I need to do is have a bunch of stories that I call one-point stories and see how long they take in the aggregate. So this, this process only works in the aggregate. And, and again, I think one place where this kind of, where people make, uh, where people go astray in this is starting to think that individual point estimates, individual feature estimates have more validity than they actually do, when in fact they only have validity in aggregate. So when you look at this in aggregate, you see that the kinds of things that can make this, this kind of estimate go wrong are sort of larger scale things. Like I can talk about having made a bad assumption. Like I may have assumed that this reporting feature only needed to be delivered on the web, but they also need CSV and PDF files. That's a, an incorrect assumption on my, point, my, point, my part. I might have misunderstood the problem. Um, you have scope creep, where once they see, once the user sees it, then they're like, oh, you know, the columns are in the wrong order. I want to be able to alphabetize stuff. Uh, I need it to be, uh, I, I, I need to be able to drag and drop columns or something like that. Um, those obviously, those are outside initial estimates off of the time, a, a lot of the time. Um, there's unknown complexity. Uh, I need this to integrate with PayPal. How hard can that be? Uh, that kind of thing. Um, and then there's rework, which developers, I think, overlook a lot, which is a very sort of the back and forth that goes along when uh, a very, that's not quite scope creep because it's more like this needs to be blue or it needs to be alphabetized. It's not really adding scope. It's just coming to a shared understanding of what uh, needs to be done. Uh, and that's the kind of thing that we often don't consider when we're coming up with a time estimate as developers because as developers, we tend to be optimistic, um, both about our own abilities to solve a problem and about the amount of support time that it takes to get, up, get something to develop to, to production. Uh, as developers, we tend to overlook project management time, testing time, deployment time, that kind of stuff when we're creating individual estimates. And of course, sometimes there's pressure to create low estimates, and that happens in a lot of different ways. It can be a manager saying, this has to be done by the 15th. Uh, I don't care. You know, it has to be done by the 15th or else you're all fired. When's it going to be done? Uh, the 15th. Um, or it can be like, I know this is going to be a long conversation if I say that this feature is going to take three days because the client's not going to understand that. It's much easier for me to just say it's going to take a day and deal with it at the, <laughs> on the other side. Or it can be something like, I know that this is a $400,000 project, but I'm not going to be able to sell it at a $400,000 project, so I'm going to say it's a $250,000 project. None of those things are exactly like the kind of shining lights of our profession, um, but they are all things that happen. Um, but the, th the problem with that is that giving something a lower estimate doesn't actually make the problem less complex. It doesn't make it more likely to be finished by the 15th. It doesn't actually make it a $250,000 project. Uh, and it doesn't actually make it a one-day feature. Um, these are all, you're all just, you're just setting yourself up for much more difficult conversations later on, uh, which is, uh, I don't think it's a really great way to continue to run, to, to run projects, okay? So, to do better in terms of estimates, you embrace the kind of uncertainty and don't chase false precision. Adding decimal points to estimates don't make them more accurate. They just mean that you know how to use the divide key on your calculator. It doesn't really tell us anything about the problem. Okay. And it's also important to focus on the parts of the problem that people actually are pretty good at estimating. So if you think about what, if I take an individual feature, like for example, a reporting feature, I need to create a bunch of administrative reports. And I think how much calendar time that's going to take. Very broadly speaking, there are three factors that go into that. 
the actual complexity of the task, how good the developer or the team is at, at, at producing the code, and how much time in that period they're going to actually be able to spend on the task. Okay. Those three factors together more or less combined to, to be the, the, all the work. Okay. So if, let, let's look at those a little bit. We're actually really bad at estimating how much time we're going to spend on a task. We tend to be very optimistic about it. Uh, if you've actually measured how much time you spend with your code editor open as opposed to something else open, uh, you probably found that that was an appallingly low number, um, if you're me, and got so frightened by doing that once that you swore never to do it again. Um, uh, but it tends to be very consistent over time. Like My meeting schedule is basically the same from week to week. I spend about the same amount of time at lunch from week to week. I spend about the same amount of time on Twitter from week to week. Over time, this is a consistent number, more or less. Okay. The skill of the developer, the second factor. Uh, we're really, really bad at thinking about how much time an individual developer is going to take on an individual feature. Uh, and that's fine, because a, product es a project estimate is a horrible time for uh, your team to be arguing over who's going to take more or less time on individual features. It's very, very bad for team morale to walk around saying, like, uh, Noel, I'm sure you could get this done by Thursday, but if I gave it to Bob, he would have it done by Tuesday. Um, that is not a good, any metric that's not like when the whole team can deliver this project tends to be very destructive over time. But if your team stays the same from week to week, then your team skill tends to be consistent from week to week. Um, ideally, they're actually getting a little bit better from week to week because they're learning stuff. Uh, but for the purposes of this, it's roughly consistent from week to week. Which gets us to complexity, which developers are actually pretty good at estimating. If I showed you five stories from a project I was working on, even without context, I'm really confident that we would have a very consistent sense of which of those features was the most complicated and which of those features was the least complicated. And I'm even sure that we would be able to come up with a pretty good, rough, relative complexity. This feature is twice as complex. This is one and a half times as complex, that kind of it. It's something that we have a very good sense of. Um, to think of it a little bit more graphically, almost none of us could tell us how many blue diamonds it would take to fill up this entire slide. Uh, but every single one of us will be able to say that it would take more red triangles to fill up this slide than blue diamonds. Uh, and most of us would be able to say at a quick glance that it would take, it's about a factor of four, that the red, the red triangle is about a quarter of the size of the blue diamond. Okay. That's a kind of uh, reasoning that developers are actually very good at. So if we focus on that, we estimate the complexity of each, pro of each individual story and not try to think about how much time it's going to take and we just let the time sort itself out, what we get is the classic definition of a point in an Agile project, which is a unit of complexity and not a unit of time. Okay. If somebody starts talking to you and they're saying that a point should be about four hours or six hours or whatever, and I'm, I'm going to say that in a restricted context in about 10 minutes. Um, but if somebody says that, they are either like completely wrong or oversimplifying or possibly both. Um, a point is a measure of complexity, and it's basically develop, d dimensionless. Teams tend to find their own levels on them. Like you more or less understand that a point is a simple story that we can get our heads on that doesn't have much uh, individual logic, and you sort of work up from there. Okay. And what happens if you estimate everything in points is that you get to an understanding that your team can do 10 points a week or 12 points a week or something like that, and then all of the other stuff doesn't matter. Everything else averages out. The amount of time I spend eating lunch, the skill of the team, uh, you know, our meeting schedule, as long as it's all roughly consistent, we don't care about estimating it individually. All that happens is we found out that we can do 12 points of work, and as long as everything else is consistent, which is a big as long as, um, this is pretty robust. It has a little bit of like an up and down, but over time, it's, it, can be very, it can be pretty robust. Um, so if you think about it, it's a little bit like basing the estimate uh, of going to the airport on how far it is to the airport and how fast I normally drive, um, which as you can see if I put it that way, that it's going to be roughly true but not precise. Um, but that's fine over a long period of time, roughly true but not precise has a very strong tendency to even itself out. Um, but the important thing here is consistency uh, in a couple of different dimensions. 
Like the team size needs to stay consistent. Adding and subtracting people to the team uh, really messes with this or can really mess with this. Um, it's important that you're consistent in how you grade stories and that you also have roughly the same mix of small and big stories at all times. Helps, it, it makes this a little bit weird if you have a few small, if the number of really big stories changes uh, a lot. Uh, and the overall environment needs to be more or less consistent. Um, the hidden, really hidden skill here is the ability to decompose your complicated problem into more or less similar sized chunks. Um, if you can do that, like all, almost everything about creating estimates gets a lot easier. Uh, that's real, that, that's the, the key important skill. Um, but you need a little bit of data for this to work. Like you really need uh, two weeks or four weeks or six weeks of data uh, to get a velocity that you can have any confidence in. Um, and the problem with that is it doesn't really help you estimate things at the beginning of a project. Um, and it's still, a one-off estimate is still a problem. Like in a completed project when the client comes to you and says like, I need one more thing, how long is it going to take? Like that's still problematic. And there's, it's almost, you know, for, for most of the reasons we've already come out, co covered, like it's hard, it's still very hard to make that not problematic. And we still have the problem of how to do anything at the beginning of a project before this data comes in. Um, so the technique that I use at the beginning of a project, uh, which I call kind of the worst way to do this except for every other way I've seen, um, is to fake it. Not fake your knowledge about the project, but to fake your velocity. Uh, you need to, in order to make this work at all, you need to make a rough guess of what, how much time it's gonna take your team to do a point's worth of work. But you can do it in a very, in a, if you, in a very controlled way uh, and with a lot, sort of understanding of what you're doing. Don't spend a lot of time chasing precision here. You're not gonna get precision. Uh, and, and spending time on it is just, it, it's just a waste. What we come out of this process with is an output that is a range of probabilities, a range of a low estimate to a high estimate. Um, and how you present that to your manager or your client is going to depend on your situation. Uh, but what you, what you get out of this is uh, a low value and a high value. So the way that this works is you take what you be your best understanding of the scope of the project, ideally this is part of a process where you're creating this with the client, um, and you split the tasks down as best you can and assign points to them in much the same way that we've already, that in, in the way that we've already talked about points existing. Uh, so a one, ta a one point task is easy uh, and something you can get your head around. A three point task has a bit of more complexity or risk. Um, I usually tend to spread the numbers out a little bit here. A five point task has more complexity or more risk. Traditionally people use Fibonacci's from here so the next number you would use is eight and then 13 um, to indicate more and more complexity or more and more risk. Don't spend a lot of time assigning points to a single task. Um, if you can't, trying to argue over whether something is a one or a three is the kind of argument that you lose just by having it. Uh, you can't possibly win that argument. Just round up. Round up will help, rounding up will help with your consistency and it will counteract your normal tendency to be optimistic about this stuff, uh, at least a little bit. And when I'm doing this estimate at the beginning of a talk and only at the beginning of a talk, I, at the beginning of a project, uh, I will give stories a range. Um, this reporting feature, if this gem that we might use will actually work, then it's a three point story. If it doesn't work, then it's an eight point story. Over the course of a project, I hope to be able to refine that, but at the beginning of the project to make up for the fact that I don't know anything, I will give it a range of values. At the end of that, hopefully without too much pain, uh, you have a range of points. Uh, you add up the, the low numbers, you add up the high numbers, and you come up with something that says this project has between 100 and 120 points of work. Uh, and you can refine this more for high priority versus low priority or something like that. How you do that, again, is gonna depend on your context a little bit. And then you, kind of the really hand wavy step in this part is the point where you have to say like, uh, the, a point is gonna be somewhere between five and seven hours. Um, I give it a range, again, like I just said 10 minutes ago that anybody including me right now that tells you that points are uh, a particular set of hours is oversimplifying. I'm oversimplifying. Um, but you need to get to a number. And the most effective way that I can do, that I have found to do this is to assume that there's a range uh, and then that 
combines with my low and my high number to give me a low and a high estimate for the number of hours. So I have 100 point, I have 100 to 100, 120 points and five to seven hours per point. That gives me a very broad range of 500 to 840. Um, this process usually comes up with ranges that are going to be much broader than to be useful um, in a particular context. So often we present only the middle of the range um, uh, as a, a, because the, the extremes of the range are much less likely than the middle of the range, ideally. Uh, and then you can multiply this by a load factor to get talent, calendar time. You can multiply it by a dollar amount to get a, a budget. Um, and then you need to present that. Uh, you present that to your client. Uh, and when you present, or your manager, or however. And how you present that is just as important as what the process is. Um, unfortunately, like, there's a lot of things about that that I can't tell you because it's going to depend on your context. But generically, it's important to have that be part of a process where you explain the limits of this. Um, at Table XI, we often have this sort of elaborate script spreadsheet of graphs that we show that show uh, the range of possibilities if you only choose high priority stories or if you choose medium, lower priority stories. Um, but we try to do a really good job of explaining how we got to this estimate what is in it and what is not in it. The problem is that very often when you say to somebody, uh, this is going to cost between $75,000 and $126,000 is, what they hear is, this is going to cost $75,000. Um, and that is a tendency that you need to counteract. Um, and one of the ways to counteract that is by really focusing on the things that need to happen to get to the low estimate, the way that everything, the things that need to go right um, the idea that it is a, a, a minimum uh, uh, and not necessarily a likely. Or in some cases, you just don't present the minimum at all. You only present the likely number. Again, you know, it's a situation that you have, to, you have to kind of read. So you need to describe the results. Um, you need to understand that this is going to change over time, and you need to be flexible to that. You need, you know, one of the advantages of the agile method of you know, points and velocity and things like that is it gives you a really nice cadence to see whether the project is uh, headed towards being completed on time or not. And that gives you an opportunity to have further discussions about ongoing scope, uh, ongoing rework, and uh, ongoing priorities. So that is also part of it. The estimate is not a static thing. It's a thing that exists over the life of the project. Um, because ultimately, like, all the people in the project are kind of headed to the airport together. Um, and it's best that you both have a common understanding of where you're going and how long it might take you to get there. So uh, that's it. Thanks. That was uh, 29 minutes, if I'm counting right. Uh, so close. Um, uh, I have one image credit and a couple of things that I want to tell you about. Again, I'm, you can find me on Twitter, at Noel Rapp. Again, feel free to, to say hi or ask a question. Um, I work at Table XI in Chicago. If you finish this and you thought, wow, uh, I really want to hear everything Noel has to say about running software projects and, and agile projects, uh, I have a self-published book called Trust Driven Development. Uh, which you can find at noelrappin.com slash trdd. It's normally $15, but for the next couple days with the coupon code rubyconf2015, very creative, uh, you can get it for $10. Uh, it will probably never be around at that price again, so if you want to be one of the lucky like dozen people or so that have bought it, uh, have at it. Uh, I also do a pro did a book on testing for Pragmatic, uh, which you can find at that URL, uh, prag.com to enter test two. Uh, and that's all I've got. Thank you for your time and attention. I uh, hope you're really having a great time at the conference and enjoy the next couple days. Um, I have time for a question, I guess, but thank you for your time. <laughs> I have a couple questions. Well, OK, so the question is, like, doesn't Agile imply that you don't have a master plan at the beginning? Um, I think that that is sometimes true. So we sort of get, there's sort of a, a, a Distinction between like the ideal agile project um, and the way things sort of exist in the world, uh, and what and how you can kind of move between them. I find it very very difficult to work with clients on projects where there is no master story plan to start off with. Even if it's just like we would like this to be the first release. Like these are the things that need to be in the first release, and it's not the entire project. Um, I, I think it's beneficial to set an initial endpoint and say this is what's in and this is what's out. I think otherwise. It's just really hard to understand whether the project's going well or whether it's going bad badly. So it's a deviation from the manifesto. Um, I don't know that the manifesto really the manifesto itself really talks too deeply about it, that level of detail. 
um, it may or may not be a deviation from how a lot of these people think. It probably is. I'm, I may be deviant in this respect, what can I say? <laughs> question back there? The, right. The question is, do I find it useful to put points on things that are not features that are like bugs or chores or things like that? Um, my answer is no, although I, I see the argument for yes. Um, the argument for no is that it's very, very hard to estimate bugs, um, and chores are not, in an agile sense, user-facing stories. Um, the math works out as long as that is a, a consistent percentage of the work. It's like, if, every if everybody's doing 25% of their time on bugs and chores every week, then you still have that consistent cadence and the points still hold. Um, where it becomes a, that's, uh, in practice, that becomes a problem because ultimately, ideally, like at the beginning of the project, you're doing more chores, and at the end of a project, you're doing more bugs. It doesn't quite work, so it, it does tend to be, it, it can get in the way of the estimates a little bit later on. Um, ultimately, the point is supposed to be a measure of complexity. The story is supposed to be something that provides user value. Uh, a bug that actually does provide user value can come in as a feature. I, I don't know if that's actually kind of an answer, but I don't, in general, find it valuable to estimate those and, and add points to them. Right, so, the, so, so what the question essentially is that I'm making an implicit assumption that there's a very direct relationship between complexity and time, uh, and that may not be true. Um, my inclination, and this is, I think, truer, the, the larger the project is, the truer this is. My inclination is to not try and outsmart the process. Like, if I think it, but, but that gets tricky. Like, maybe what that means is this, the one point story that takes a lot of time is actually, if it has a lot of pieces that can be verified separately, then maybe the thing to do is to break that into several one point stories that can be independently verified and independently deployed. Maybe that can't be done. Um, I think that that, there, like, I was on a project, you know, not all that long ago where we had a data migration story that was one point, because we kind of understood what the migration was, we didn't immediately realize that we were migrating like 35 tables and it took like three weeks. Um, that does tend to, th maybe what that means is, um, but in that case, I think you can say that we legitimately underestimated the complexity of it and should have had multiple single point stories. Um, I think that there are always gonna be outliers and I think that, you, that, that um, my experience is that trying to outsmart the process doesn't work a whole lot and that overall you're just saying like for, for the, sometimes there'll be a one point story that winds up taking several days and sometimes we'll have a one point story that takes five minutes and that they're just like it's just a pro, it's just a 50% chance of rain like it's a probabilistic thing uh, it's, it's not a super satisfying answer it's like the least bad answer I have to that question sure uh, so the question is, do I consider like making the user stories flexible in terms of the complexity? Yes. I mean, sometimes you say like uh, I, one of the metaphors is like the bicycle car, the bicycle version of this, the car version of this, and the truck version of this, uh, or the you know so, like the the penny nickel quarter version of it. Yeah, some, you do need to go. You, you do need to go to that. Ideally, um, you know, some, depending on how you do it, sometimes you go to do that at the beginning of a project. Sometimes you do it at the beginning of an iteration. Um, the earlier you can do it, the better you can fit it into the estimate at the beginning. The later you do it, the more you can respond to the, the practice on the ground when you get there. But yeah, that's, some, that's something you change. Like, yes, there's a version of this that's going to solve 80% of your problems at 20% of the time. Is that good enough? Like, that's, that's always a constant negotiation. So yeah, that is something you do. So the question is, is do, you, do you take into account the consideration of choosing the framework when you make the estimates? Strictly speaking, I would say, like, strictly speaking in the don't outsmart the dumb process kind of way, uh, no, because what I, what, 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 the way that would play out in the process is the complexity of the stories is the complexity of the stories, and what the framework will do will impact the velocity. So I would, you know, if, if the framework, if we're all struggling with the framework, then our velocity is going to be lower, but the stories are the stories. Um, in an ideal world where you have a very long project, you have time to see that play out, and you see, oh, our velocity here is only seven, and we thought it was gonna be 12. It becomes a little bit more problematic when you have to say something at the beginning, you have to kind of guess. It's another level of unknown. Um, so, you know, at some point, right, at some point, eventually we come down to the future is the future. Um, and we just try to, we can try to manage that, um, but sometimes we can't. Like, <laughs> I feel like all I'm saying is, yeah, shrug, yep, that's a problem. <laughs> Got me. Uh, any other questions? <laughs>
Cool, I think we're good. Um, thanks, I'll be around for the next couple of days. Um, I talk about this stuff a lot, so feel free to come up to me and ask me more questions about it or tell me where I'm wrong, uh, because that's great too. Um, thanks. <laughs>